I hated punk. I, I think I, I thought a lot of the punk quickly descended into kind of oi, which I, I, I just loathed. I was into, you know, I grew up listening to The Who and uh, T-Rex and Sweet, and I loved SOS by ABBA, and so did Captain, and I think that's where we kind of bonded musically. Um, and punk w was kind of, I mean, I lived in London, I, I, I'm from South End in Essex, and I, I left school to join the Hot Rods and moved to London in 76 when I was 17. And it was all going on, but there was no, there was nothing calculated in the band I was in, the Hot Rods, and nothing calculated in the damned. Nothing really calculated, particularly in the Stranglers. Pistols was totally calculated. You know, they, they were another kind of like Simon Cowell type with a Malcolm McLaren, Sven Guy, Sven Guy type figure. As were the Clash. People don't like hearing that, but that's what it was like. Um, you know, you listen to the Pistols album, half of them didn't play on it, it's overproduced. It's not punk, nothing like the first Damned album, or the first Hot Rods album, or the first Ramones album, that's kind of really raw and rough. And, you know, I, I thought the, the, the punk thing with all the bin liners and the spiky hair, I just thought it was daft. Joe Strum had a band called the 101ers, which was um, uh, an old pub rock band playing old Chuck Berry songs. And he was desperate to kind of get up, you know, to get a record deal, whereas the Hot Rods didn't give a fuck, you know, we just went to get up and get pissed and play songs fast, and that was it. And it was between the 101ers and the Hot Rods as to who Island Records would sign, and how Thompson, the A&R guy, who wasn't much older than us, and we had all the labels chasing after us, but we just took the piss out of them. And whoever bought us the biggest tray of beer for the night, we thought, well, we're going to sign with them. They understand us. And Howard chose us over the 101ers, and he told me not long ago that um, uh, when he went backstage in Nashville to tell Joe, he, he, he kind of burst into tears, because that was he thought that was his big kind of potential bit of stardom over. And Bernie was around at the time, and it was the, the clash, the difference between, you know, I mean, I, I was friends with the captain and rat, and used to go out to piss and stuff at night with them all at the time, 76, 77. And they were much like the Hot Rods. We, we were just ourselves, a bunch of kind of like fairly rowdy rubber baits, just thinking we can get away with this, and even get paid for it, and get pissed, you know. Whereas the, the, the clash thing with Bernie was very, uh, there was a plan there. It was like a five year plan, you know, which included signing to a major label. So it's very calculated, you know, I don't think that there was punk at all. It was very, very major label calculated. Whereas what the Dam were doing, what the Hot Rods was doing, you know, the Hot Rods were a punk band. No calculation in it. We winged it, you know, and even the, when I joined the Dam in 1980, we just winged it. And we had no, you know, I think we had six, seven, eight managers in the three years I was with them. You know, they had heart attacks or nervous breakdowns or fled with the money. You know, it was utter chaos. Always totally skint, you know. But the one thing that kept us all going was the music. There was no grand plan. And we just kind of kept writing and kept playing as long as people would buy the records and, and pay to see us. There's no plan about getting big record company deals, things like that. Um, what was the question? <laughs>